Okay, so good morning, everybody. And uh, my apologies for being absent this morning. I um, <laughs> hardly slept the night before, maybe three hours max. So um, I kind of woke up in the middle of the night last night, and then I went back to sleep. <laughs> I missed my alarm. So I'm leading by example. <laughs> you are allowed, if it so happens, to sleep in. So, but I did wonder if you'd all still be here, if anyone would have rung the bell. <laughs> and you'd have missed your breakfast, and you'd be sitting in the deepest samadhi. <laughs> I don't know, maybe some of you were. <laughs> anyway, so today's talk, I'm kind of joking now, it's about suffering. Is that a good topic? <laughs> oh, right, okay, sorry, because it's actually about happiness. <laughs> And it's actually one and the same. It's two sides of the same coin. Because um, the Four Noble Truths that the Buddha taught can be defined in a very positive way. Sometimes there's this myth that Buddhism is all about the suffering, focusing on the suffering, uh, not having any fun, everything's suffering, where should we even smile? But actually, the Buddha has talked about two things, suffering and its end. So the end of suffering is uh, basically the same as happiness, right? And this is the highest kind of happiness. <clears throat> so you can also see these Four Noble Truths as happiness, the definition of happiness, the way to achieve happiness, why we're sometimes not happy, and the fact that we're sometimes not happy. Sometimes we're really not happy, and sometimes we're often not happy. But uh, the Buddha is concerned with freeing ourselves from what he calls the prison of samsara and the prison of suffering, and uh, if you think about what, I don't know how many know the story of the Buddha's going forth, but he was raised in luxury by his father, who was a, a sort of um, mini king. There were lots of kingdoms at that time, so India was split up into different, actually, countries, if you like. And he was protected almost too much, to the point where he really got fed up of it, probably, you know, when he was a young man, and he went outside the palace walls for the first time. And there he saw a sick person, a um, dead person, an old person, and a recluse. And it might be so obvious to all of us that we get sick, we die, you know, we get old. But to him it wasn't because he was concealed from that. But when he saw the recluse, he realized, wow... There's all this sickness and death which touched him very deeply, but there's also a way out, there's a way to seek a path. And this was a very much an alive kind of idea in India at that time. And still today, you'll see many, many different kind of um, uh, aesthetics there. Aesthetics, right? Not the pretty stuff, but the <laughs> recluse stuff. So um, there's this concept, you know, that you can live a household life or you can live a life of renunciation. And still there's a lot of respect for that path. So, and when the, the Buddha saw this person, presumably he was much more happy than the other people. And this is what attracts us to the path. We might say we want to talk about suffering, and of course it's our really deep concern because this is what we're in right now. Hopefully a little bit less than you were when you came. Mm -hmm. But uh, actually what inspires us is to see happy people, people that are at ease, that are content, that have kind of, in a sense, stopped the search. You know, they, they have a sense of inner happiness that bubbles up from inside. And that is sustainable. That is actually not so dependent on conditions going just right, because we can never rely on conditions. So this whole path, in a way, and the path of the gradual training that's taught again and again in the suttas, is a progressive refinement of wholesome happiness. Only the first beginning part is an understanding of suffering and a confidence that arises from understanding that that suffering can actually be a catalyst for a spiritual search. So in one of the sequences that the Buddha teaches, he actually says suffering is the cause of happiness. So it's not like you're just destined to suffer and there's no meaning to it and it's something we should push away. It can actually be the cause for digging a lot deeper and as I said before in a talk, you know, for me, some of the suffering that I experience physically with a chronic gastric condition is a cause for greater compassion, a greater perspective on life. And also, it helps me look inside my mind for, this, for the happiness, for the spiritual meaning of my life. And I'm not saying I'm in terrible pain all the time, 
But we can use whatever life gives us to dig that bit deeper and to find a meaning in this. And this is a different kind of happiness. So this hopefully leads to some confidence in the Buddha's teachings that, yes, he's pointing us to the places where we suffer, but to stimulate a wish to be free. And then he's not just saying, okay, get on with it. He's actually compassionate enough to give us a path. And once we have a little bit of confidence that it can be done, that he wouldn't ask us to train this way if it couldn't, and that we all have absolutely what it takes by being born as a human being, then this confidence gives rise to inspiration and energy to walk the path. And in a way, this is the first kind of happiness we can experience in the Buddhist practice. Of course, much of these happinesses come together or at different times. But there's a certain confidence, uh, a certain happiness to confidence, to feeling assured that, yes, I'm on the right path. And this is very inspiring. It's a great relief. For me, that was kind of the fuel for the next seven years of practice. You know, I just felt so fortunate to have found the path. I couldn't believe my luck, really. And it felt, although I was 20 years old, I felt like I'd been searching for it for eons, which may have been the case. And I knew this is something precious that I can't let go of, you know. And I kind of was in a very fortunate position. I'd rebelled and gone to India. So I decided to give the rest of my life, basically. But I had a clean plate, no responsibilities ahead. And I decided to book in for the next retreat and then serve and then give and then meditate again and then serve. And bit by bit, that confidence got validated and it became deeper inside. It became a kind of... Um, what's the word, like a verified confidence, not just an idea that this is leading somewhere, but an actual experience that, yes, I was becoming more balanced, becoming more um, at ease with the ups and downs in life. It's not that I didn't have ups and downs. There's certainly lots of ups and downs in my tummy, lots of parasite visitors, and all kinds of hassle that you get from living, you know, in, a, in another country, and, you know, often a lot of... Um, sexual harassment or a feeling of not being safe, which I shouldn't really make too much light of, but to be honest, it felt like whatever I had to face, didn't, it didn't matter because I had the path, I had a way out. So this then gives us the inspiration to practice ethical conduct virtue because we know that there's some results of that and the Buddha directs us to um, experience those results. You know, he says that before we do a virtuous act of body, speech, or mind, usually body or speech in this case, we should reflect on the beauty of that intention before we even do it. You know, just to feel that our lives are aligned with goodness, with our innermost values, and feel some confidence and happiness and joy because of that. And the joy that it's going to bring someone else as well, right? So when people come to our monastery, for example, often they've been up really early that day. Sometimes they've been preparing the food the day before, just for one non, usually. Um, but they put so much love into it. And I think part of that ritual, if you like, is actually the joy of doing it and the recollection of what it means to offer to the Sangha, who will hopefully then practice sincerely and share the Dhamma. So it's something much bigger than just a meal. It's something really beautiful. And then the Buddha said we should reflect on the goodness that we do. Simple things, even while we're doing it. So if you give a donation somewhere or support a charity, do you just do it and think, okay, good, you know, I've done my bit. It's not much, but it'll do. Like, okay, forget about it and carry on your day. Or do you actually really take stock of the meaning of that and how much it took to make that decision and how much letting go it involved, even if it's a small amount, it doesn't matter because it's not measured that way. It's measured by the happiness that it brings you and the degree of letting go. And then also to reflect on it afterwards. And in these ways we can really boost the happiness and the joy that can arise from virtue. And he said that this can also lead us, a, a virtuous life leads us to simplicity and contentment and also wakefulness. Yeah? Do you recognize things like that as a type of happiness? When you're kind of awake, you feel bright, you feel like you're starting to see the world. You know, people have said they're starting to see all the little details in the forest, 
how many kinds of green are there? Especially today, now that the sunshine's coming out, it's just incredible. You could probably count, I don't know, hundreds of greens. Don't do that, but <laughs> <laughs> just notice it, you know, and how the leaves and the little drops of rain sparkle like diamonds. It's just really quite magical, and then the softness of the moss. And so we start to wake up to, to life, you know, we wake up to what's going on inside, and, and because we have this sense of wholesome bliss, blameless bliss, and a vajrasukha, um, it leads to a sense of contentment that we're starting to feel we have enough. We don't actually need to keep on chasing and searching for something to stimulate us because we already feel awake, we already feel content, we already have plenty, and it's not measured in how much we have. Some of the happiest times in my life have been living on you know, in a kind of concrete block <laughs> on a little tatami mat on the floor with a, more like a brick than a pillow. And um, never mind the elder beetles here. I mean, there you have mosquitoes. <laughs> Sometimes you have um, ant infestations. I remember once there was like a... It wasn't even a ribbon. It was like a tar trail or something across the wall of ants that had swarmed in to make their nest and they were full of eggs and everything. <laughs> then I looked under my little tatami mat and they were all there as well. And I just had to wait like for a couple of days for them to pass through. But it didn't worry me. I just felt kind of like, yeah, I belong to, they belong to, we're all in the forest together and it's about just working on my reactivity, right? So, I mean, here they were actually waking me up. <laughs> So after a while, you know, when you're tired, you're a bit more reactive. But uh, but I kind of quite like them too. <laughs> I won't gross you out anymore. But yeah, I've had a few more encounters with them since, and I have a feeling of affection. And, uh, <laughs> so this is all an aspect of you know being contented and living a simple life that's closer to nature, that's closer to uh, non-craving, if you like. And then, as I was saying yesterday, one of the next stages in the training is, um, I mean, they're not really linear, they all come together, but a progressive refinement of virtue is the virtue of the mind, which is um, sometimes translated as sense restraint or guarding or protecting the senses. So it's really how we use our mind. And this leads to something that's called unblemished bliss. And the Buddha says, you know, when we notice that we have lived a good life, done something beautiful, we can really get inspiration and keep on training day and night in wholesome states. He says it's like when you go to bed at night and you're sitting on your bed and uh, just as the sun, when the sun sets, it sort of casts a shadow over the mountains and envelops the mountain. He says we can re recollect the goodness that we've done and happiness will overcover and um, envelop and overspread us just like the shadow of the sun overspreads and envelops the mountain. So we reflect on the goodness that we've done, and we feel, yes, I'm living a blameless life, more or less. Don't reflect on the negative stuff, because that's, you know, that's part of life as well, but bring up the good. And um, another example of this in the suttas is uh, some of the monks living together, and they were really good friends, and they were practicing mindfulness by basically taking care of one another. So when the Buddha asked them, how do you develop mindfulness? They would say, well, you know, whoever comes back first from the arms line, sets out the seats ready for everyone else and puts out the water for washing the feet because they would go barefoot. And then we eat our meal and if there's any leftovers, someone leaves it for the others. And then the last person to finish would tidy up. But then even before they would go to meditate, they would check out if something needed fixing, like somebody's robe had a hole in it, which happened or the bowl had a scratch or a crack, because at that time, actually, they used ceramic bowls. And first of all, they would take care of that, but without breaking into speech. And they said, so even though we're three in body, we're one in mind, blending like milk and water, looking at one another with kindly eyes. <laughs> That's where the kindly eyes comes from. And then even when they meditated, they sit down to meditate, and they think, what a great gain it is for me to be with so many virtuous companions in the holy life, in the spiritual life, in this hall. <clears throat> you know, what a great gain it is. You could be with any other people. You could be with your sworn enemy right now. But actually, you're with really good people. And this is such a benefit for all of us. 
So we can really bring this kind of happiness up in the mind, and it's a feeling of gratitude as well. It leads to greater harmony with yourself and with others, and with life, because you're starting to soak in what is good. And also in meditation, at this point in the gradual training, the Buddha says, this is when you start to develop real mindfulness, when the hindrances have been at least reduced, and there are these kind of foundations of sila, of ethical conduct in the mind. It becomes much, much easier to start to be aware of what's going on, because you're not concerned with all the things you've done wrong, and you know, fixing up all the faults in your life or in your mind. And after that, then we can actually sit down and develop samadhi. And whether we do that through the breath meditation, which is a very, very popular method that the Buddha himself used for awakening, or whether we do that through the metta practice, which is also a very essential part of the Buddhist path, we have to ultimately pass through the stage of piti sukha, which means rapture and a kind of inner happiness. Sometimes sukha is translated as pleasure, sometimes contentment, which I really like, sometimes ease. But it's really a deepening of the happiness that comes from inside. So the PT might be the first kind of experience you have of this inner happiness. And it can be defined, as I said, as rapture. It's usually caused by an interest in the object of meditation. You're starting to get um, interested in what's happening. Or you're starting to get still. And actually, if you just stay with what initially might seem like something quite blank or bland or nothing spectacular, just a little bit of peace, but you stay and you allow yourself to wake up to what's there. You're not looking for what's not there. You're not looking ahead of yourself to what might be there. You're just staying with your experience with a sense of reverence, if you like, like a real sense of valuing and noticing what's there, and just resting in that. And then, after some time, you might experience this as pleasure. And that pleasure can be experienced in different ways. It can be experienced as a kind of um, flush of tingling in the body, like a shower. It can be experienced like um, a flash of something just kind of zoom across the head, or not a elder bug, <laughs> a kind of tingling or... or it can be experienced as very momentary, or it can be experienced for longer periods of time. It can be intense, it can be mild and just peaceful, like floating, or just feeling calm. And all of this is perfectly fine. We just allow it to be there. And this is when the vitaka, our initial application of mind onto the object, for example, the breath or the metaphrases, start to become sustained because there's some interest there. So you can easily maintain that awareness for like many, many minutes in a row. Maybe you can continue with the phrases for a full half an hour. And it's almost like they're starting to be connected by this underlying piti that's arising in the body and mind. And it usually starts in the body. We experience things in the body, especially in the meta practice, because we're staying embodied on purpose so that we keep that um, happiness inside, to build it, to build it, to let it grow not to just let it bubble out as soon as the first bit of joy comes up. You know, hey, everyone, you know, I got some joy this morning. <laughs> so the silence is really helpful for that. So um, we let it build. And after some time, this kind of goes more and more into the mind. You start to see that actually the mind is producing this. The beautiful qualities of the mind are, in a sense, shaping the way we perceive what's arising. They're shaping the way we experience, say, the breath. Because the breath is just breath, right? It's not particularly painful most of the time, unless you have asthma. Even then, the breath itself is neutral. It's not particularly pleasant. It's just breath. But when the mind becomes beautiful, it starts to experience the breath as very beautiful, very delightful, and it becomes so easy to stay with that breath. And it's the same with the metta. You know, at first it's like, okay, I have to plant another seed and another one. And I don't know how it feels for you, but I know a lot of you have started to experience some joy in this. And please don't think it has to be in the form of piti. There's a joy in simply being free from ill will. Yeah? One of the words for metta is avyapada, 
In fact, it's the choice word when it comes to the right attitude. The Buddha often um, defines things in terms of their absence. So it's the mere absence of ill will, of um, fault finding. This is an important one. Because it's obvious, you know, it's easy to notice when we have ill will, outright ill will, you know, not really wanting to be here, not really enjoying the breath and even being negative, like, or negative to the phrases, it doesn't mean anything, and <laughs> it's not working. But there's also something subtler called the fault-finding mind. And this is just kind of noticing the negatives all the time, rather than noticing what's right. You know, noticing where the breath is not calm and quiet, noticing where the PT doesn't arise after the metaphrase, instead of noticing what is there or what is absent, such as remorse or uh, fear or a sense of dis-ease, you know, the lack of those things is a kind of joy. So I wanted to get on a little bit to, I've gone far too far already, according to my plan, but uh, (laughs) I did want to talk about the Buddha's own struggles with happiness and how he defined happiness, which you can probably guess now already, Um, but go a little bit more into that because sometimes we're not sure what kind of happiness is wholesome and we also have a resistance to taking it in and I know many of you have mentioned things related to that in the questions or in the groups. So what did the Buddha say? And it's very interesting that before his enlightenment, he actually thought that all kinds of happiness should be shunned, were to be avoided, were kind of wrong. I've heard a quote, and please forgive me if this is offensive. I've heard this, it's not my own opinion. But I read this sort of one-line joke that said, religion is the fear that somebody somewhere is enjoying themselves. (laughs) (laughs) And... There can be some truth to that, right? Because even if we don't think it's wrong to enjoy ourselves, we, at some point we sometimes have a bit of guilt arising. Is that common for anyone here? There's a bit of guilt, like either we don't deserve it or other people don't have it, why should I be happy when there's a war? You know, when there's poverty, when there's refugee crises and political crises and all these things, you know, is it right for me to be happy? But how can it be wrong? I mean, is your suffering going to create more happiness or more suffering? (laughs) If you go under, how can you help another? You know, and aren't you one among all beings? We want all beings to be happy. And this is, I think, a powerful reason why the Buddha starts with oneself. Because if you yourself are not happy, not resourced, how can you ever help another, really? You're going to be just too focused on recovering for yourself. And I've been through burnout a couple of years ago, medically diagnosed adrenal fatigue, and, you know, I was in need of a long break, which I didn't really ever get, but, (laughs) you know, I've definitely recovered sort of at least the normal curve of adrenaline coming and going down in the evening, not very high, but at least to some extent. So, you know, we need to have that resource in ourselves in order to really help another person. So the Buddha believed it was all to be shunned as well, which might be reassuring. And for six years, he actually practiced austerities, almost starving himself to the point where he'd eat like a spoon of rice per day. And it might sound incredulous, but I got so sick in Myanmar that at one point I was also only having maybe two or three spoons of rice, rice gruel, really horrible, cooked on a wooden stove in a really bacteria-infested concrete kitchen, and with no salt or anything. <laughs> and it just wouldn't go down. You know, I just couldn't eat it. I got so sick at one point, I was eating like that for about three months and hardly going down. So this is a kind of austerity, although it wasn't intentional. Um, and after a while, the body can't cope. The body gives up. It's not the middle way. And then during this time, he realized that. He realized that, you know, he could barely stand up. And it said that when he touched his tummy, he could feel his backbone. That's how thin he was. It's kind of (laughs) shocking, isn't it? Um, But then he remembered this time when he was seven years old or so, sitting under a rose apple tree. So all the great events of the Buddha's life happened under trees, outdoors, in the nature, just one with it all. Not a hot dog. (laughs) (laughs) And not the final goal. But uh, (laughs) sitting under this rose apple tree and watching his father do the ploughing. 
And I'm sure his father was someone to look up to and he felt very safe, he felt very content and he was just chilling out, right? He wasn't trying, he wasn't striving in any way, he wasn't saying, I must chant another phrase or I must watch the breath. He was just sitting under the tree and he spontaneously went into a very deep meditation which he recognized as a jhana. And um, he remembered this and the thought came up in his mind, is this the way to enlightenment? And then he thought, yes, this is the way. It was an intuitive sense. And that's when he started to eat again. And the lady, Sujata, she is always a great woman behind every <laughs> enlightened person. <laughs> Unless you are that enlightened person. Um, so she gave him the rice and milk, which was, it's still quite popular in India. It's called kheer. And there's some cardamom in it. It's very delicious. And maybe some honey. And so he started eating that. And his five friends, who'd been sort of spurring him on all this time as a potential enlightenment candidate, um, they abandoned him at that point because they thought he'd resorted to luxury. But he stood his ground and he hurried on. And later on, he did become enlightened through, again, going through those deep meditations um, and waking up under the Bodhi tree. And his first teaching after his enlightenment was addressed towards these two extremes. It was called the middle path, or the middle way. And he basically warned against following the path of austerities, which tire and exhaust the body and mind. Atakila Matani Yogo means literally practices that fatigue the body and mind. So you don't have to be able to touch your backbone to be practicing this. Anything that is overstretching you, fatiguing you, too much internet, <laughs> <laughs> too much admin. It is a kind of Atakila Matani yoga. It's not the middle way. And the other extreme is the indulgence and sensual desire. Because this is not the kind of happiness that frees. It's the kind of happiness that keeps us prisoners and slaves to those desires. The Buddha explains sensual desire like a debt that you have to pay back. And there's no more obvious example of this than addiction. What starts off as a relief, something that's a high, something that's intoxicating and seems to take away the pain, becomes something that's addictive and draining and ruins the quality of your life. And you have to pay it back, you know, you have to go through the withdrawal, which can be hell. And I'm speaking anecdotally, because I've not experienced that myself, but in a sense, we have these addictions, even someone was saying in an interview, to social media. There's a dopamine hit, and you pay it back the next morning at the time. You're like, oh, it's amazing, it's like midnight, and I'm still awake. Like, I'm sure there's another really interesting post coming somewhere. <laughs> and then the next day, you feel horrible. You have a big headache, and you, know, you just feel drained. And if you'd just gone to bed earlier, you'd feel fine. You'd get up and meditate. So um, he actually warned against these two. And then he described the middle way. And the middle way, it's important to say, is not some kind of balance between the two, some kind of medium place, which is not really indulging and not really sensual, but it's also not hurting us in any way. It's not some kind of blank, bored, dull, miserable, <laughs> really, <laughs> sounds miserable, state of mind. It's actually something that goes in a completely opposite direction. So it's like you've got the two extremes here. The middle way is not here. The middle way is like here or here. or It's a totally different paradigm. It's a different direction altogether. And it's the direction of going inside, inside the mind for the happiness within. And it's, of course, founded on the insight into the noble truths because you've realized that going this way or this way is more suffering. And instead, we go inside. And so we're coming to the bit I like now, which is how the Buddha defined pleasure. And he does this in the Arana Vibhanga Sutta, which is Majjhima Nikaya for any people who want to get into the suttas. Number 139. I can write it up if you want sutta references. And in there he says, one must know how to define pleasure. And knowing that, knowing that one should pursue the pleasure within oneself. So in this sutta, he's basically saying, first of all, you should pursue pleasure, having defined and discerned between the wholesome and the unwholesome. And so the one not to pursue is the sensual pleasure. 
And please bear in mind here, because you're all lay people, maybe there's some potential future monks and nuns. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> at least in your next life, if you're you know, not going to do it now, but you might as well do it now. Um, <laughs> why wait? <laughs> so he defined this sensual pleasure as something not to pursue. It doesn't mean we can't have it. It just means we shouldn't like make a beeline for it, right? And kind of make ourselves weary, make ourselves exhausted, and really kind of dig in a place that's not going to reap much fruit. Because, you know, there are natural pleasures in life, like enjoying our food is good because it's good for our digestion, like enjoying times with our friends, hopefully alcohol-free. <laughs> enjoying <coughs> nature is a very beautiful and very um, humble and innocent sensual pleasure because, really, it, it brings us more in contact with um, the natural laws that govern this world, right? So there's something we can learn from nature and there's something to be revered. So there are many pleasures that we can have, but just not to pursue them because that will involve choosing a lesser pleasure over something much greater. Yeah? So the Buddha actually said that that kind of pleasure is coarse, it's common, it's ignoble, it doesn't lead to Nibbana. So remember his aim is always taking us to Nibbana, taking us to some deeper pleasure. So it's not a moral judgment as such, but it's a reminder that there's something more, there's something greater, deeper, more beautiful, more subtle, more profound. And guess how he described that something deeper? Ooh, my friend. <laughs> I swear they like me. This is an elder bug. I think of them as terries because when you're a senior monk or non, you become a terror or a terry, like terry garter. So, and these are called el elder means Terry, Terry means elder. So this is a Terry. <laughs> a senior bikuni, bog. Anyway. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so the type of pleasure that he did recommend was the four jhanas. Are you surprised? Because sometimes in meditation circles, people think we can get attached to that bliss. But actually, it doesn't really say this anywhere in the suttas. It actually says we should frequently develop those kind of wholesome states of mind. And that the only danger there is the stream winning, once returning, non-returning, and full enlightenment, the four stages of enlightenment. That's the outcome of pursuing the jhanas. Right? So, and he had beautiful words to describe the happiness of those states. And the first uh, word, this applies to all four jhanas, is paviveka sukha. It means, sukha means happiness or pleasure. Uh, the happiness of seclusion. Yeah? So again, it's looking at an absence in a sense. The happiness of being secluded from all that kind of um, irritates the senses, all that kind of burdens us and that we get attached and cling to. In other words, those lesser happinesses. But also being secluded from the five sense world altogether and going deep, deep, deep inside. Paviveka means really deep seclusion. Viveka is seclusion. Pa is an intensifier. Like parinibbana means like all around cessation, all around going out of the flame, going out of the defilements. And the next uh, word he used was nekama sukha, the happiness of renunciation. There's a happiness when we can let go. There's a happiness of non-control, non-possession, just being free, just being at ease. You know, like when you drop some of your burdens, there's a happiness there. There's a happiness coming to retreat, especially in the beginning. Hopefully it deepens, but when you first notice that, ah, oh, I don't have to get up and go to work today, that's a happiness of renunciation. So really soak it in. And then upasana sukha, this is an important one, the happiness of peace. And this is really beautiful because it's not a kind of stimulating, agitating happiness. It's a happiness born of peaceful states of mind. That's why I was saying sometimes it arises when the mind is very calm and you don't really see much going on. And actually, if you just stay with the quiet, and at this time, for example, in metta, you might not really be inclined to use the phrases and you might think nothing much is happening. But if you just stay with that quiet and enjoy it and start to notice the subtleties of it, then suddenly it can increase without you even noticing. And it's happened to me where I've just shifted my attention and just 
ask myself to notice peace or to notice bliss. It's almost like a subconscious voice that comes from inside, usually conditioned into me by my teacher. He said it in a talk. <laughs> and then suddenly what seems very dull can become overwhelming rapture and bliss and happiness that it really empowers the mind. So it's born from peace. And he also called it Sambodhisukha, which means enlightenment happiness, which can be a little bit uh, confusing because the jhanas are not enlightenment, but it's the kind of happiness that you experience as an enlightened person, precisely because the five hindrances and the defilements have been temporarily overcome. So this is the main difference there, that it's only a temporary uh, release of suffering. And there's not very much suffering there at all, because the five senses have vanished and the mind is fully bright and purified for the time that you stay in. So we have to learn to gradually let go of a lesser happiness for the sake of uh, a deeper one, something more beautiful, and also tune into that, because it's almost like we're not um, yet, we're looking for something close to the pleasure we already know, because that's what we know. So we expect it to be kind of stimulating or like very obviously pleasant, um, but it's almost like we have to tune into a different frequency in our mind, like you tune into a different radio station. You know, you have, it's really hard to tune into, I don't even listen to it, I never listen to it because I could never tune in actually. <laughs> it was like, and uh, I didn't really find it very interesting anyway. But there's all this distortion, isn't there? And there's like all this kind of strange terrain where there's nothing really happening. But when you can kind of just tune in, then you notice there's something beautiful there and you nurture it and you allow it to grow and it grows in its own time. So the reason we need to develop uh, happiness deliberately is also because of uh, this thing called negativity bias. And I'm reading a book at the moment by Rick Hansen, recommended by another Bikuni friend, called Hardwiring Happiness. And it's quite interesting because in there, there's some of the latest neuroscientific research um, and it always aligns with the Buddha's teachings, or should I say, yeah, that's the way around it is. You know, basically it just proves what the Buddha said all this time ago. But one of the things that's quite interesting is that he's saying we do have this negativity bias, which literally pulls our attention towards what's wrong, towards what's <clears throat> negative, and it overreacts to it, and it stores it in our implicit memory, in our kind of experiential memory that tells us about the world. So we store those negative events in an attempt to protect ourselves from similar things in the future. But actually it distorts the reality of life. And at the same time, we don't take in the positive. They slip through our mind. We don't notice positive or neutral experiences because they're not that kind of impactful and they don't stir up that survival instinct in us. Our main, the main way we're wired is to survive, right? So he's saying that the negative are like Velcro for the mind and the positive are like Teflon. They just go right through. It's like a sieve, you know, like the sieve kind of collects all the negative, which are like big chunks, and all the positive just flows right through the sieve. And it underreacts to the good. And one of the little examples given there, which I think is great, is, um, and this is the way it's developed in our brain, is that for our ancestors who lived in the jungles, I guess, and in the Stone Ages, I don't know what kind of animals were there, but the example is given of tigers. So one situation is that you think there's a tiger when there isn't, right? And this leads to a lot of anxiety. It makes you a much more nervous person, much more on your guard, much more in the fight-flight state of the nervous system. But the other um, possibility is that you think there's no tiger when there is a tiger, and what's the outcome of that? Death. So our brains choose anxiety over death, survival over quality of life. And they're still doing that now, even when there aren't any. These little beetles, they don't eat you up, you know. They're actually totally harmless. They really are. They're just little things that want to breathe a little bit longer. So the problem is that we're still wired this way. And his rationale is that because of this bias, which is obviously a bias, we have to level the playing field. So by cultivating the good, you're not 
giving yourself an unrealistic idea of the world, you're actually just balancing something that's biased, something that's out of whack. So we're just leveling things up by bringing this capacity of the mind, and it can actually influence the brain, to notice and store and soak in the good. And we've been talking about all the ways we can do this. You know, if you want to feel more safe, then you um, create perceptions of safety, either through your meditation or by looking for cues in, your, in the atmosphere to show you that you're safe. If you want to feel more love, you look for signs of love. You look for the way someone might look at you or something kind they might do for you. And these are indicators that there is love in everybody's heart, right? If you want to feel more gratitude, you're not a very grateful person, then you actually look in your day for things to be grateful for. You write them down, you know, this is very popular, isn't it? Gratitude journaling and all this stuff. And there's a reason for that, because we're trying to bring those impressions into this Teflon mind and get them to stick, get them to actually um, change. And it's been shown that this can change the brain. But the Buddha got there first. <laughs> he said... <laughs> Whatever you frequently reflect and ponder upon becomes the inclination of your mind. So it becomes a training, it becomes a habit, we start to notice it more and more and it starts to snowball. You know, it starts to snowball and actually not only incline our mind in a certain way, but it starts to become our character. And a character, again, is malleable, right? But this is the beautiful message, it's malleable, the mind is malleable. And the deeper we go in meditation, the more malleable our mind becomes. So from the PT, you know, where we start to practice with uh, the bliss and the rapture, it starts to calm after a while and become what's known as pasadi, which is a quieter kind of happiness, and then sukha, which is a deepening of the happiness. But really, they all come together. You can't really divide them or separate them. They're just different tones of pleasure that you might experience. Um, but they're increasingly satisfying and we increasingly need to do less. So the meditation starts to have its own momentum and it starts to flow one stage into the next until we do go into those deep stages of meditation called samadhi. And these samadhi states are completely blissful and peaceful and synonymous with a feeling of love, a feeling of unconditional universal love. Some people experience it more as peace, some people are love. Some people as bliss, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. But the point is that it's a huge resource for the mind. And at that time, you've overcome these negative tendencies, the hindrances and the fault finding and all of these things that um, keep those states hidden from you. And they're not for their own sake. This is the beauty. I mean, it does purify the mind at a deep level and it leads to insight. But one of the main reasons it leads to insight is because when you emerge from those states, the Buddha describes the mind as soft. Soft means malleable. It means it's able to see things in a different way. And also the mind becomes very powerful, very strong and very stable. So you're able to stay with an object of meditation for a long time without any distraction and just go right into it without any fear, because the mind can really turn to whichever angle of life it wants to. It can turn towards uh, impermanence, or exploring the six senses, exploring the five candors, I mean, maybe one at a time, or maybe all of them, I don't know. It can go into also spreading that metta to all beings, and this is when it really is powerful. You know, somebody that emerges from a deep state of samadhi based on, around metta, afterwards will come out and be able to really blast you with metta, you know, and this is, you can feel it when somebody does this, I mean, it's really wonderful, and really healing as well, so this is one of the reasons that these samadhi states are so conducive to insight, because for the first time our minds are unbiased, we've managed to balance that bias, and um, take away any kind of predilection towards what you're going to see. It's not like you have any vested interest. You're just open. It's like a completely free spirit of inquiry for the first time, possibly. Your old views are kind of subdued as well. You know, the mind is quiet. So you have the opportunity to see things as they really are. It's not that 
you know, one experience of deep meditation will make you a stream winner and you'll see things the way they really are. But repeated experience um, undermines those hindrances more and more and more until eventually you can actually just uproot those tendencies to greed, hatred and delusion from the heart. So unlike sensual pleasure, which actually the more of it you have, the more sick you become. Has anyone noticed? Take an example of chocolates. <laughs> Is it going to get better the more you have? Probably not. You can actually put yourself off food. I remember when I was young, I actually liked custard for some reason. And I told my mum to make the custard with extra custard powder. So, and I kept saying, more, more, more. So she added more and more until it was just this yellow, thick lump. And it was so disgusting that I couldn't eat custard again. I hardly ever eat custard. <laughs> I was only about five or six at the time. But, you know, the more we have of these uh, sensual pleasures, the more sick we become, or the more inured to them be we become, right? It's like we get used to a certain level of stimulation. It doesn't have the same effect anymore. So one year you go on holiday to, I don't know where you go in America, but say you're from England and you're desperate for the sun, so one year you go to France, northern France, it's a bit sunnier. That's, okay, we've done that. Now we want to go to, like, Greece. That's much more kind of sunny and luxurious. Done that, done the Mediterranean. Now let's go on a cruise to, like, the Bahamas or something. And each year you have to go on something a bit more special, isn't it? Each time. I mean, if it, if it really was a source of happiness, wouldn't one cruise be enough? You could just go on one cruise and then you'd be done. Ah, I've had my happiness now. But no, you need to do it every time because the uh, actual um, reward gets less over time. It's the law of diminishing returns. <laughs> but these jhana states are the opposite. The more you indulge, if you like, and this is Ajahn Brahm's word, I don't know about indulge, but they happen, you know, they happen and we can appreciate them when they do. Um, the more they happen, the more pure our mind becomes and the more inclined towards this wholesome kind of ethical happiness we are. So all these kind of happinesses that I've talked about today, from the virtue, from the confidence in the Dhamma, or in ourselves, our own capacity for awakening, gratitude, contentment, unblemished happiness, uh, quiet happiness, happiness in nature, happiness of meditation, etc., etc., all of these have one thing in common, is that they're ethically based, they're virtuous, they are wholesome happiness. And this is the kind of happiness the Buddha encouraged us to pursue. He said they are to be pursued, to be developed and cultivated, and not to be feared. So this is my encouragement to everybody here to develop happiness for the sake of seeing things as they are, going deeper in your meditation and being less dependent on all those things outside. You can still enjoy them, but it's, very, it's more enjoyable to have sensual pleasures when you're not dependent on them. When they arise, great, you can enjoy them. When they've gone, fine, you don't need them. You can go meditate, you've got all this contentment and inner peace inside. And this stops the search, this stops the chase that horrible kind of sense of longing, sense of hollowness inside, that we need something outside to fulfill us. Now we have a happiness that comes from inside. So my encouragement is to develop that happiness, to notice it, first of all, and that's sometimes enough. And when it comes, don't throw it away too easily. See if you can soak it in, maybe spreading it all the way through your body if you're in this meta-meditation and you you know, got the Piti Sukha coming up, just imagining it going all through your body and just carrying on with the phrases, which are the fuel. And over time, your mind will naturally, it will know when to start reducing the phrases, dropping them, letting things just settle, maybe going to the breath, maybe staying with the perception of metta. It doesn't really matter. Allow the meditation to be natural. The Buddha said it is a natural process. It's just the beginnings, lighting the fire, that's the difficult part. So please keep on lighting the fire and use your own goodness to help you do that. Bring it up and enjoy the goodness of your lives. So, was that as good as a talk on Dukkha? <laughs> <laughs> was it similar? <laughs> Mix. <laughs> okay, so let's have a little stretch and... Uh, 
For those who are on the interview or discussion list today, it's not an interview really, um, please feel free to leave first after this meditation ends and for the others to just give them the space. I don't think I have to say that because you're all just so naturally considerate and gentle, it's beautiful.